in these wonderful activities. God bless you. And now, Pastor Tony. Hey, thanks, Pastor Dan. So again, on the, um, on the app, if you want, there's a, there's a thing that says lesson notes. You can pull that up and take notes on, right on your phone if you want. Or if you're here, there is um, the written copy there in the back that looks like this, and it's got the notes in there, as well as an action uh, plan for during the week. Uh, you can take the lesson that we talk about today, and you can apply it to your life as, uh, as you're living it, which is really what this time on Sunday mornings is all about. Now, last week, I challenged you to take Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 19, and pray that for yourself and for our nation. And I did that. And I'll tell you, a couple of nights, man, or a couple of mornings, whatever it is, 3 o'clock, I, that's what, it seems night when I'm doing it. But uh, it just broke me to tears. It really did. It brought me to tears as I thought about how far uh, we as a nation have fallen from what God uh, initiated uh, 100, 250 years ago now. Lord, I just, I just really would pray that God would change our hearts as a people because the answer is not passing different laws or, or uh, you know, doing different crazy things that we do legally or, you know, it's not a recall. It's none of that. It's, we've, got to, we've got to change who's in charge of our hearts. And that's what Daniel's prayer was really all about. It's about changing who we are. And then as we individually get our hearts right with God, then we as a nation will get our lives right with him. It's got to start here. And so I just want to challenge you. Uh, I'm going to continue praying Daniel 9 for a while. Uh, I'm going to continue praying it until I see uh, something changing in our world. And the good news is, if you move on from verse 19, it says that the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel and says, from the moment you began to pray, the answer was given. And that, you know, that was just encouraging for me. I was praying Daniel 9, 1 through 19, but then I got to Daniel 9 in my, uh, through the Bible, you know, reading, and I got to read the rest of Daniel 9, and I thought, oh, I had forgotten about that. The moment you began to pray, the answer was given. And so God has answered us, but let's keep praying until we see that answer. So as I said earlier, I'm Pastor Tony. Welcome to LifeSpring Today. We're in a series called A Better Life. And today we're talking about how we handle disagreements and conflict in our life. How we balance getting the results that we want and maintaining the unity that is the heart of God. The question this morning is, when is victory spelled? And this would be up on the screen, so you're going to have to pay close attention here. W-O-N. One. And when is victory spelt O-N-E? One. When is victory spelt W-O-N? I'm going to get this. I'm going to win. When is it spelt one? I'm going to maintain unity here for the sake of the church. Now, if you bought lumber, I have a little construction business I run on the side, and if you bought lumber earlier this year, you may have experienced this. I needed some two-by-fours to construct a wall. And so I went to Home Depot, and not only was the price outrageous, but the quality of the lumber was deplorable. It was appalling. There were two-by-fours that were black. And I don't mean they had black spots on them. I mean they were black. And as I'm sitting there looking at them, I'm thinking about all the things that can make lumber black. And I'm wondering, do I even want to touch these things with my hands, you know? It's like, oh my goodness, this is terrible. I mean, there was, there was black. Now, there were some really all black ones. And there were some with black spots. There was, there was green ones. There was, you know, orangey red ones, like they were redwood or, or cedar. And they're in the pile with the Douglas fir. And I'm wondering, I don't know if I can build a wall with those, you know. And, and, and I'm just looking at all this stuff. It was really weird. 
And there was the assorted bent and twisted lumber that's always there because that ne- you know, nobody ever wants to buy them and they stay there until you know, COVID and they're the only pieces of lumber left. But, uh, but there was some pieces of lumber there. Literally, they were milled wrong. You know, you start with, they, they do a coarse grind on the lumber and make it two inches by four inches. But when you buy it, it's not two inches by four inches, is it? It's an inch and a half by three and a half. Well, there was some lumber in the pile that hadn't gone through the finished milling. There were some four inch wide pieces of lumber. I'm thinking, how do you build a wall when you've got three and a half pe- wide pieces of lumber and four inch wide pieces of lumber? I mean, this is not going to work for me at all. When building a wall in an industrial building, that's a problem. But when building something more important like the kingdom of God, it's a disaster of eternal proportions. Let's see what the Apostle Paul has to teach us today as we're going through the book of Ephesians. Today, we're in Ephesians chapter 2. So open your Bibles or your apps if you're at home. Uh, and, and you're able to watch, you know, you can pull up the website. It's all there. You can look at Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, there's an action plan, like I said, it's on the app, in the, on the website. It's also in that paper in the back. So you can apply this during the week. Let's go ahead and stand this morning. And we're going to read God's Word together. We're going to be reading verses 19 through 22 in Ephesians chapter 2. And we're gonna, I'm going to be reading in the New Living Translation. So if you've got that. You can read along with me. Read it with me. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Let's pray, see what God wants to teach us. Father, take your word this morning. Lord, by your mercy and by your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit, you have preserved your word now 2,000 years from the time when Paul actually wrote these words to the church. He was writing to the church there in Ephesus, but actually we believe this is an encyclical letter, and it was written to all of the churches in that whole area, and including LifeSpring some 2,000 years later. By your Spirit today, Lord, take the Word of God that went through the mouth of the Apostle Paul to your saints then and speak to your saints today. Show us how to apply this teaching in our lives here today in our world, in our country, in our generation. We ask it for your kingdom's sake. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. In this section of Paul's letter uh, to the church, He's dealing with divisions that existed in the church of his day. Did divisions exist in the church of our day? Yeah, pretty big time. And you know, when trouble comes, all it does is bring to the surface things that have existed for a long time. All of the conflicts that we see that have arisen out of this pandemic, they were there already. But in our affluence, we were able to close our eyes to them. But it's where our heart was at before this pandemic. The pandemic just brought it to our attention. All of the conflict, all of the anger, all of the fear. And yeah, I'm saying today, a lot of the anger in the church over issues relating to this pandemic, it's really about fear. But as we sang this morning, we are no longer a slave to fear. We're children of the living God. We don't need to be afraid. Some of the divisions that exist in our church, some of them are just cosmetic You know, my brothers over at the Presbyterian Church, they baptize their infants. We say, yeah, wait until they can go through a class with Mrs. Tuttle or or Tinas and and understand the decision they're making, and then we'll baptize them. It's really kind of a cosmetic difference 
in the church. We can still have fellowship together. We can still work together. We can still build the kingdom of God together. Some of the differences in our church, they're cosmetic. Put it together, slap a coat of paint on it, nobody will know the difference. But other differences were beginning to affect the ability of the church to actually build the kingdom of God. And the biggest difference, the vision that existed in the church 2,000 years ago was with, between Jews and Gentiles. And I'm talking Jews and Gentile believers, people that had come into the church that had surrendered the leadership of their life to Jesus Christ. They were walking by faith. These people that should have been brothers and sisters were sticking pins in each other's dolls. Each group believed they were right. And consequently, the others were, well, wrong. You ever see that today? <laughs> The thinking of the Jews outside the church 2,000 years ago was that Gentiles only existed to fuel the fires of hell. How many of you are Gentiles? <laughs> you think that might have alienated a few people? Jewish midwives, check this out, Jewish midwives were forbidden from helping Gentile mothers deliver their babies so as to not bring any more of those heathen into the world. That separation also existed in the Gentile world, not just from Jews, but Gentiles. Greeks and Romans each thought that they were, had it all together. The Greeks thought they had it all together. Because they had philosophy. They had developed you know, a lot of the mathematical principles. They had figured it out. They were the thinkers. Rome thought they had it all together because, well, they were in power. <laughs> they had swords and shields, and that made them the better people. You know? And so Jews and Gentiles, I mean, Greeks and Romans, they were sticking pins in each other's dolls. Greeks separated the whole world into people who spoke Greek and people who didn't. Right? You even see it in the scriptures. Every, you will read along and you'll come up, oh, Greek-speaking Jews. You'll find that in the text usually written by Luke, who was a Greek. And, and even that mindset from the Greek culture was spilling over into the scriptures. Greek-speaking Jews, those were the better Jews in the Greek mind. Right? In fact, the Greeks divided everybody into those who spoke Greek and those who spoke everything else. And they thought all the other languages sounded to them like bar, 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 bar. They called them bar, bar barbarians. Because they didn't speak the right language. Into this world comes the Apostle Paul a Roman citizen trained in both Jewish philosophy and Greek philosophy. It was Paul's practice when arriving in a new town to go first to the Jews because Jesus said that the gospel came first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And so Paul said, okay, if that's what my Lord said, that's what I'm going to do. And some of them, some of those Jews would believe his message, but all too many would start getting angry and they'd start throwing stones and, and, and they would reject him very violently sometimes. At that point, he'd take the gospel to the Gentiles in town. When he came to the city of Ephesus, he did the same thing. He said, then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some people became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way from John 14, those who were following Jesus. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. And then he held daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Tyrannus had a school in Ephesus. And he was teaching the up-and-coming generation. But in that society, and especially in the Greek culture, the, the day ended at the fifth hour. And the fifth hour starts at 6 in the morning. The fifth hour is 11 in the morning. So from 11 o'clock on, the school lecture hall was empty. And Paul said, well, I, gotta, I could use that. And so Paul took those that were believing in him to this lecture hall in the school of Tyrannus. And then he went on for the next two years teaching 
so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. The church in Ephesus was therefore this mixture of Jewish and Gentile believers. But at the time, Jews outside the church didn't gather with Gentiles. Not at all. They didn't have, they didn't have lunch together. They didn't meet together. They didn't sit in the same house together, even under the best of circumstances. There was something truly unique happening here in the church, but it's what God always intended. When God called Abraham out of Ur the Chaldees, he said to him, I am going to bless you so that in blessing you, you will be a blessing to who? The whole world world. This is what God had always intended, Jews and Gentiles together serving the living God. Unity is possible in a church when Jesus is at the center of everything that we think and say and do. When the closer we get to Jesus, the closer we will naturally get to one another. As all of us move in toward the center, as we allow the word of God to be foundation upon which we build, then, then we come together and in unity with Jesus, we become unified with one another. It has to work like that. Today's church divides itself over some interesting issues, none of which are a part of the gospel that we are here to represent. Look at the things the church is currently dividing over. Are these the kinds of things that ought to divide us? Should we? I mean, politics is important. But should politics divide the church of Jesus Christ? No. No. I don't care who you voted for in the last election, Whoever would be sitting in the White House right now is nothing compared to the people that were in power when Paul wrote these words. I mean, people are fighting. I mean, angry words about different ways of managing this pandemic. We need to let grace, mercy, truth, covered in love, guide our hearts. How can we build the kingdom of God with integrity if we're a bunch of misshapen wood? We've got to get right before God. Daniel 9. Let's begin by looking at the root cause of division that we have here in our society it begins with an understanding of who you are in the world. Who are you in this world? In our natural state, apart from what Jesus has done in us, we're separated, disconnected. We're, we're, we're messed up people. We're self-centered. We're that bad lumber in the pile. Paul describes us in verses 11 and 12 here in, in chapter 2. And he says, remember that you were one time you Gentiles in the flesh called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, by hands, not by God. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. That is who all of us, most of us probably were. But in this world, we allow all kinds of things to separate us, but it cannot be so in the church. We all deserve God's judgment equally, every one of us. It is only through his sacrificial death on the cross that we have any way to stand before God. We must never allow, okay, one of the things that's been separating us in the last couple of years, race. We must never allow race to separate us. I've said it before, LifeSpring is the most racially diverse group of people in Moorpark. And I am excited about that. I think that is so awesome. That is the way it's supposed to be. Every tribe and tongue and ethnicity coming together to worship the living God. That's how God wants it. That's how it'll be in Revelation. That's how it should be today. I'm thankful that race has never been an issue here. 
Paul says in Galatians 3, there is no longer Jew or Gentile. Human beings have allowed ethnicity to, to separate us from the earliest records of humanity. You can go back as far back as we have records, and, and you've got all kinds of uh, examples of race separating people. And how have human beings dealt with it? Slavery. You're different than me. You'll be my slave. Uh, we, we've used genocide. You're different from me. I'm just going to wipe you out. Apartheid in our generation. Even in our enlightened society here in America, the epitome of the human solution to the racial problem in America was what? Integration. I'm a child of the 60s. I grew up going to school in the 60s, in the middle of this whole racial episode in our history. And how did, I grew up in Los Angeles, I mean, not Kansas, okay? I mean, race was an issue where I grew up. And how did integration work out? Well, my generation, school children were bused to the other side of town. And guess what? We put all the whole potpourri of human racial, you know, situation into a classroom, and guess what? It didn't solve the racial issue. You know why? Because the racial issue is not an issue of ethnicity. It's, a race, it's an issue of the human heart. And by putting all of those races in the same room, <laughs> you just created problems. The problems that existed in the macro level now existed in the classroom for the teachers to deal with. How about that? It's an issue of the heart, and only God can change a human heart. Paul says that we even allow religion to separate us. He says here in Ephesians 2, you were called uncircumcised heathen by the Jews. Uncircumcised refers to their religious affiliation. Sometimes churches have acted like they were in competition with other Bible-believing churches in town. Now, when we read verse 11 here, we're not talking about what they were saying outside the walls of the church. Paul's talking about what they were saying inside the walls of the church. You're a Jew. I'm a Gentile. Mm, nothing to do with you, right? No, we can't allow racial issues. You are circumcised. I'm not circumcised. We can't allow religious, those kinds of circumstantial, surface religious issues to separate us. There is one church in this town and the head of that church is not Pastor Tony. It's not Pastor Keenan at the Presbyterian Church. It's not Pastor Gordy. The head of that church is Jesus Christ. I meet regularly with all the pastors in town. And we pray for one another's ministry. We pray for the word of God to go forth in this town. We pray for revival in our city. Now, don't get me wrong. Some sizes of lumber don't belong in the same wall, right? Right? In the same way, some issues of theology ought to separate us. Denial of the deity of Christ, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, the authority of Scripture, the nature of God. These are non-negotiable issues of faith. These are the hills we need to be willing to die on, but not every hill needs to claim our lives. Not everything we allow to separate us is a non-negotiable issue of faith. Some stuff is just the natural differences in the grain and the hue of lumber. And we've got to be able to tell the difference between what is an issue of orthodoxy and what is an issue of personal preference. And I encourage you, if you are not in one of our growth groups, that's where you'll learn this stuff. You know, my Matthew study on Wednesday night, we're in chapter 2, so it's still not too late to join if you want to. We're talking about the nativity on, on, on Wednesday night. And at the end of the class, you know, one of the girls says, well, thank you, Pastor Tony, for destroying everything I know about Christmas, you know? It's like, but we can talk about the truth, right? Because guess what? Whether or not there were three wise men or a whole entourage of people, it's not a non-negotiable issue of faith. You want to believe in three guys on camels with little cold chests? Go for it. Hey, I've got a nativity set too. You cannot buy a nativity set with an entourage coming from the east. It just, they don't sell them, you know. The real problem is in our natural state, we're incapable of unity. There's only one thing in the universe that can bring this disparate group of people together, and that is Jesus Christ. So let's look at the one who brought us together. 
Let's look at the one who brought us together. The prophet Isaiah said that Jesus would be called the Prince of Peace. He would be the Prince of Peace. God told Isaiah what he also told Paul in in verses 14 and 15 uh, of chapter 2. He says, for Christ himself has brought us peace. And in fact, in, in the original Greek, that word brought isn't there. For Christ himself is our peace. Christ himself is our peace. He united Jew and Gentile into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jew and Gentile by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. The text said that we are blood relations because of the cross. Jesus' desire is that his church would be united as one. He broke down the barriers between Jew and Gentile by being the Prince of Peace. If that is what he has done at great cost to himself, if he gave his life for this, if that was so important to Jesus, we need to be very careful before we build up any walls between us and our brothers and sisters. So let's look at who you are now in Christ. Paul gives a great summary here. Kind of a, not even a summary, it's just kind of like a shotgun blast of a few things. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by his spirit. God calls you fellow citizens, fellow citizens. In the U.S., we take our citizenship very seriously. It comes with both rights and responsibilities. And while being a citizen of our country is a big deal, and and it just breaks my heart when I see people who treat it so disrespectfully, it's a big deal to be a citizen of this country. But being a citizen of God's kingdom is so much greater, so much better, so much bigger. For that citizenship will last for eternity, and so will Jesus' kingship in our lives. Check this out. There's no provision for a recall of Jesus Christ. (laughs) Doesn't exist. Amen. It doesn't exist. But believe it or not, human beings will try. I mean, check it out. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 9, at the end of this thousand-year reign where Jesus Christ himself sits on his throne and the holy saints are co-reigning with Jesus Christ, creating this perfect utopian society, guess what? A rebellion of a multitude that cannot be counted will try and remove Jesus from power. That's how deep the depravity of the human heart extends. Our kingdom citizenship comes with rights, like forgiveness and heaven and adoption and eternal life. We talked about them in chapter 1. Communion with God's spirit, power for living, all of these amazing blessings of being in Christ. But it also comes with responsibilities. Jesus Christ has to be our king. He has to make the rules. We have to bow our knee. We have to submit to his authority. Yeah, I know. It would be so much better if we did it my way, it seems. (laughs) We've been doing that in this country since the 60s that I'm aware of. My dad could probably tell you more. We've been doing it our way, and it doesn't work. It's time for the people of God, at least, to do it God's way. And yeah, I mean, God tells us to do some things in here that that I get it. They go against our culture. You need to have a relationship in a way, you need to have your relationship with a member of the opposite sex in a way that is different from the way the people of this world think it's okay. You have to do that. 
And we say, yeah, but God, you don't understand. It's 2020, 2021, right? We, we've learned some things. We know some things. No, we don't. No, we don't. We don't get to self-identify as anything. We don't. We are what we are. Some guy in the Netherlands, a 45-year-old guy, wanted to self-identify as an 8-year-old so that he wouldn't get convicted of pedophilia. I'm just saying, how far does it go? Right? We We are the children of God. We were created by God on purpose. This is who I am. There's a lot about me I don't, uh, I don't like, this face to start with, okay? I, I mean, I think, I, I've got a cousin in Mexico that's got jet black hair. He's 10 years older than me. I think I should have jet black hair. I know I can, but it looks stupid. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right? I mean, that's what I think. And then I look at my other friends who have no hair, and I think, okay, I guess I'm Okay. <laughs> Not complaining. (laughs) Right? I mean, there's things about me I would want to change. God, if I were creating me, there's a few things I would do different. I would be able to sing. My apologies to the worship team. I sit in the front. Right? I mean, there's some things about me that I would change if, if it were up to me. But guess what? It's not up to me. It's up to the king. And what the people in the world around us do, that's on them, right? But we are the children of God, and we must be different. Jesus must be king. You are a citizen of heaven. As crazy as it sounds, God calls you saints. Now, you know, if we don't understand Greek, we may not, or Latin, we may not understand what God is calling us when he calls us saints. Saints are not, you know, when the saints come marching in. It's not that. The same word translated saints is the word that's translated holy. God says, you are holy. Look in the mirror sometime and say, I'm holy. No, I'm not. (laughs) No, but God calls us holy. God calls you holy. He considers you holy. He considers you something special. God calls you a saint. And then guess what? He fills you with his Holy Spirit to change you from the inside out so that you grow into his declaration of who you are. Your job is simply to cooperate with the Spirit in order to be the saint he called you to be, to live and love like Jesus in this crazy, dark, broken world. You are members of God's household. With God as your father, you have been adopted into his household. You are united as brothers and sisters. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, you're my brother or my sister, you know, whatever they are. Tell them, you're my brother, you're my sister. God is our father. We're a family. This is God's household. Amen. Amen. I love you guys too. I heard some of you saying that, right? I mean, the relationship we have with one another is many times deeper than the relationships we have with our own families of origin. God declares the reality. It's up to you and I to live it. God says we are joined together. We're joined together. Now, when it talks about a man and a woman being joined together and becoming one, the word actually is translated, you know, the best translation is superglue. When you're talking about a marriage relationship. That's not the word that's used here. This word that is mean joined, I mean joined is the perfect translation of this word. It's, a, it's actually a word that means to take two disparate things together and put them t- together with a joint in the center. Right? So that you can do things with this joint that you couldn't do if you had just glued them together. That's what God does with us. He doesn't glue us together to form one new thing. He joins us in such a way that we retain our unique identities, and yet together with one another, we're able to accomplish even greater things than we could do individually. 
And what is that great thing he wants us to accomplish? We are growing together into God's holy temple. You are a brick in that temple. Now, God may have you placed in the south wall of the men's room. You may not like that placement. You may think you're better suited up front here, where every, behind the cross, you know, as part of the, the mosaic. You may think that you belong on the altar. You may think all kinds of things. But God knows best. You are men's room material. <laughs> Your part is to trust him and be the best men's room brick you can possibly be, wherever it is that he placed you. It is God who's building this temple, the church. He is building it on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, on the word of God, with the important cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Each one of us has been given a role to play so that the church may be a redemptive influence in this world, that we can build a bridge for people to cross over to the Savior. That's our job. That's our only job. That's our only job in this world. You may think your job, you know, is to work for the city or, to, or the company or, or you're self-employed and, and you work for your customers. or You may think your job is something else. Your job is to bring the redemptive purposes of Jesus Christ to bear on this planet. That is the only thing that, that, that matters here. Those relationships that you build so that people can build a relationship with Jesus. Each of us has been given a role to play so that the church can be that bridge. And you need to ask yourself this morning whether you are fulfilling your role in God's church or not. If you are, good. Good for you. If not, you can change that today. Get on the team. If you're here today, if you go in the back, there is a, there's a flyer in the back in the lobby. It looks like this, Serve Like Jesus. If you're not a member of the team, if you don't have some regular responsibility here every week, grab this, check a box, put your name on it, give it to somebody or put it in one of those gray boxes and get on the team. I did a funeral a couple days ago. And funerals always remind me of a stark reality of my own life. There's a box like that waiting for me. And when I get to that point, I want to be able to say, like the woman that was in the box on Friday, that I have run the race, that I have done everything that I possibly could. And when my body would no longer work, I prayed for every single thing I could have done and would have done if my body would work, and I kept at it until the last moment when Jesus called me home. You know, it doesn't matter how much money is in the bank or how big your house is or how many cars or any of that stuff. What matters is, did you, were you a good building piece in the temple? Did you build the kingdom of God? Because when you cross over the threshold of eternity, that is the only thing you're going to be thinking about. It's the only thing you'll be thinking about. And I feel sorry for so many professing Christians. They're going to walk across the threshold of eternity and think, oh my goodness, I wasted all of those years. Don't be one of those people. Don't be one of those people. I've done funerals for those people too. Don't be one of those people. If you're at home, this thing, is on the app. You can fill it out at home. This temple God is building is designed to be a dwelling place for his spirit. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price, the precious blood of the Son of God. 
God actually lives in you. Paul started this discussion challenging you to remember where you came from. You were dead in your sin and ruled over by Satan and his demons. You were by nature deserving his wrath. There is not a single person in this room or listening to the sound of my voice who can stand on his own righteousness or her own righteousness before God. There is not a single person right now apart from Jesus Christ that can stand before God. Any superiority that we might feel over someone else because of our, you know, we go to LifeSpring, and, or I'm whatever, and I'm a different race. I'm smarter. I've got more money. I've got whatever. Any superiority that we might feel is a lie from the pit of hell designed to separate us from our purpose. Any thoughts you have that would lead you to discriminate upon anything is evil. And perhaps that sounds harsh. That's what Paul's telling us. Paul commands us to remember our past because in doing so we can find the humility that leads us to an appreciation for all that Jesus has done and is doing to bring us into a right relationship with God and not just us, but this entire planet. If we have this attitude, we're not going to be judging other pieces of wood in the wood pile. Instead, we're going to be allowing Christ to shape us into a temple for a holy God. The devil and the world, they want to teach us that life is a zero-sum game, that in order for me to win, someone else has to lose, and I need to stand on the heads of others in order to be that person. My old boss at 3M Company uh, had this picture on the wall When you came into his office and you sat down, you looked at this picture that was taken when he was a soldier in Vietnam. And it's a picture of him and his buddies all huddled together, standing on a pile of Viet Cong dead. It's in his office. It's his philosophy of life. Life's a zero-sum game. The ones at the top of the pile win. The ones at the bottom of the pile lose. That is not God's idea. That's how you spell victory, W-O-N. But that's not how Jesus spells victory. Jesus says that true victory happens in a unity of heart and thought that can only happen when he is our Lord and allows us to be an influence in the world around us. True true victory is spelled O-N-E. How do you spell victory? Not how have you spelled it. How do you want to spell it? going forward. If you're here on site, I need you on the team. I need you on the team. Because of COVID and people that aren't comfortable coming back to church yet, we're, we struggle every single week to staff our children's programming. But Nancy and Laura and Tinas and me and Stacy, we are committed to making sure that we're doing everything we can to the gospel of Jesus Christ will go unhindered to the people in this community. I need you on the team. If you're comfortable coming to church on Sunday, I need you on the team. I need you to step in. I need you to roll up your sleeves. I need you to help. If you're at home, I still need you on the team. I still need you on the team. I don't know. We're going to have to figure out because I don't think this is going away for quite some time. So we're going to have to figure out, we're going to have to get creative. We're going to have to figure out how people at home can still be on the team. But if you are committed to doing it, you need to call me, you need to email me. We need to start a dialogue. We need to figure out how this can happen, how we can together at home and here be a united team to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to a hurting and dying and desperate world. If you've never surrendered the leadership of your life to Jesus Christ, that's where it starts. And so if you're here or you're at home and you've never surrendered the the leadership of your life to Jesus Christ, talk to me. Talk to me. Let's make that happen. If you need to be baptized, talk to me. Let's make that happen. COVID is no reason for the church to be in neutral. We've got to be driving to the future. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for life that we have, for your spirit that dwells within us. 
empowers us for living, empowers us to be the church, to be united, to be the voice crying into this community, be reconciled to God. And Lord, how are we going to cry to a community, be reconciled to God? You sinful people can be reconciled to a holy God, but I hate my brother in that church over there. How, how can we do that with integrity? Lord, start with our own heart. Make us one, one with you, one with one another. And then let our voice be heard in this world. Let our voice be heard. There is a Savior. There is a Savior that can change everything that's broken, everything that's wrong. And he's coming back. Let's get ready. Let that be our voice in Jesus' name. It's enough time for a potty break, get a cookie and a cup of coffee, and we'll be right back. And lots of food back there. Lots of food. forever.